Hello, I'm Arielle Wengroff. We are just at the beginning of how crypto is changing the world. There's so much to learn, so let's go find out more about it together. Are you ready to come with me further down the rabbit hole? Hi everyone, welcome to Down the Rabbit Hole. Every week we'll come together to explore the world of crypto. And today we are back at Le Fendre. And by the way, the amazing piece of art that you're seeing behind me is actually by the digital stunning French artist P-Boy. We're so happy to be here. And every time, as you know, we're gonna be exploring this new world, talking to people deeply involved or newer folks figuring it out, like me. And today we will go to Nigeria, which has established itself as a giant in the digital art and NFT space, and talk with a couple, Kathleen and Arthur Brightman, the founders of Tezos on the blockchain. We're also gonna be diving into the Web3 game that has taken kids and some adults by storm, Axie Infinity. So, welcome down the rabbit hole. What happened this week in the world of crypto? If you've spent the last week on a desert island without any connection, or you just didn't have your Wi-Fi, you can catch up by watching Seven Days in Crypto. It's Right Now by Kareem Warbosh. While this happened, this, or even this on Earth last week, Planet Crypto didn't stop spinning either. Small news roundup with the Seven Days in Crypto. And we start our world tour with a first stop in Central America, in the country at the heart of the crypto news. El Salvador. El Salvador. Less than a month after having made headlines by adopting Bitcoin as a legal currency, like the dollar, El Salvador is still making news with the Volcano Project. A project to mine Bitcoin from, well, from volcanoes. Used because abundant, the use of electricity produced by the geothermal energy of the Santa Ana volcano also has the merit of being green and sustainable. In a tweet published by the self-proclaimed coolest dictator in the world, Nayib Bukele, the president of El Salvador announced that his country had just mined its very first Bitcoin using this technology. To be continued. We continue our trip with a stopover in the Pacific, in the city of Carrera in Australia, for the sale of the week. While this car found abandoned in an old Australian farm was initially estimated at $15,000, its value increased considerably and it was finally put up for auction at Lloyd's. Lloyd's auctions are revving it up again with an important race car auction event. The explanation is simple. This Subaru ProDrive 555 Group A was in fact the car that the 1995 Rally Championship winner Colin McRae had driven for the WRC Championships back then. Sold for $364,000, the lucky buyer paid in Bitcoin and confirms the willingness of Lloyd's auctions to open up to cryptocurrencies as announced in a press release earlier this year. Bid now at lloydsauctions.com.au a little detour via Brazil and the Bill 230315 of the deputy Orio Ribeiro, who intends to have the Chamber of Deputies vote on a legal framework for cryptocurrencies. Eu sou Aurio Ribeiro, autor do projeto de lei que visa regulamentar as moedas virtuais no nosso país. If the law is adopted, Brazil would follow the steps of El Salvador and Bitcoin would allow Brazilians to do their daily shopping or even buy a house. The law also provides for stricter surveillance of exchange platforms, which would be monitored by government oversight. Hoje eu avanço para a regulamentação do criptoativo, porque é de forma libertária. O mercado vai se ajustar e vai avançar no Brasil. And we finish our tour of the globe with a stop in the United States and the sharp decision of the president of the U.S. Federal Reserve. So Mr. Chairman, as a matter of policy, is it your intention to ban or limit the use of cryptocurrencies like we're seeing in China? No. No intention no, to ban. No intention to ban them. Let's seize this moment to take a quick look at the cost of Bitcoin, which has just exceeded $50,000, the first time in over a month. <laughs> That's it. The seven days in crypto is over. We'll see you next week for a new world tour of crypto news. Our guests of today do something that would be unimaginable to some of us and that's that they live and work together. They're actually linked by the blockchain, and they're partners on one of the world's leading cryptocurrency projects called Tezos. So we're excited to chat with them today. Hey, Kathleen. Hey, Arthur. Hello. Hi. How are you? Very good. Well. 
Good, good. I'm so glad. Well, thank you again for joining us down the rabbit hole. Uh, listen, I know that you know Tezos as a project has had many ups and downs over the last few years, much much like uh, many things in cryptocurrency. How how has that experience been for the both of you? I mean, it's mostly been ups. <laughs> um, it's honestly like if you look at the average, it's pretty awesome, um, and uh, it's very satisfying working with someone who you love very much. So no complaints on this end. It's definitely a roller coaster, and uh, and like you say, it's very characteristic of the industry. Everything moves very very fast. <laughs> it's very high highs, very low lows. I think it's part of the you know I, I think it's part of entrepreneurship in general or, or 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 starting something. That's what you sign up for. Well, I mean, this is amplified by the fact that it's a nascent industry. There's a lot of personalities. Um, I think until the rubber hits the road in some of the use cases, it's all going to be a lot of um, fluff. Uh, but you know, we're starting to see a lot of um, people actually adopt this technology for pretty interesting real you know use cases so um, it's been actually quite invigorating well that's great yeah i mean I, I think to your point anytime you start something new there's a bit of that entrepreneurial let's roll up our sleeves um but we're certainly curious you know because people have become so fond of crypto today um there's much more adoption but what was the value of tezos you know one year ago I think it's. I, I think it was, you know, pretty much what it is now, which is that, you know, it's it's a cryptocurrency and a, and a blockchain platform that has credible prospect for longevity, and it does so because it can upgrade itself. And you know, historically, cryptocurrencies were launched and they never had any prospect for upgrades. You know, they were launching. They were launched one way, and they would just stay this way forever. Well, That's no, they could promise things in the future, like Ethereum promised being proof of stake when it launched, but it never did. But so, it didn't have it didn't have it didn't really have a way to upgrade itself as opposed to like let's all get together and let's all agree to upgrade at the same time, which is a very ad hoc mechanism. And I, I think the value the, the, the value of Tesla is that it introduces this explicit governance model where people can actually take control of the platform and, and and decide how it evolves. And so then, I mean, based on that philosophy, do you, what do you expect, you know, in a year from now, if we were talking again, that you would hope for Tezos? Um, I think we've had a lot of upgrades over the past uh, uh, few uh, few years. Some of them have um, have uh, touched a little bit on how the consensus algorithm functions, but mostly it's been improvements in speed, uh, a, a, a few features here and there. What I'm hoping to see in the next year is even bolder technological changes for the uh, for, for the platform and embracing scaling. Well, I mean, to expand further, um, one thing that a recent upgrade introduced was the idea of liquidity baking, which is effectively um, a way to introduce liquidity as a common public good in the network. Um, this is something that's never been tried before in a blockchain, but it's something that's novel because of, um, you know, the, the I guess, Tezos approach to smart contracts, among other things. So um, more, more bold uh, innovations that uh, liquidity or blockchains would like to have. Um, and low, you know, a few, a few weeks after, I guess, liquidity baking was introduced, another blockchain tried to basically copy the innovation into their own uh, chain. So, um, you know, we're trying to be trendsetters and uh, and a bit more forward looking than your average um, average crypto project. And in general, so that, that's for the technology itself, but also for the project as a whole, more adoption. We're seeing more brands um, launch, for example, products on Tezos. So seeing more of that, even, you know, getting to the point where people are using Tezos on the day to day and don't necessarily know that they're uh, they're using it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to go to a different point that I want to ask you about, but I do think that that's an interesting notion about sort of trend setting or things that, you know, one platform might say they can do versus another because theoretically a lot of the debate around different blockchain, uh, you know, coins or projects is that they should be open source and available for, for all. So how do you sort of quantify, you know, what does it mean to be a trendsetter or to, to kind of get copied, quote unquote, right, in this new world? So I just think that's sort of like an, an interesting takeaway. But, um, you know, Arthur, you worked for several years at Goldman Sachs in New York, and you got to experience the financial crisis in 2008 that, you know, the world really experienced as well. But how do you take those learnings and the, those lessons to, to crypto and you know many people speculate about a potential crisis or fall here um, do you think that's coming you know how, how do you kind of bring that frame of mindset in uh yeah i, I think there's, there's, there's two points here one about you know um the general macro picture and saying how the financial system works as a whole and you know my specific experience in finance my specific experience in finance is as a quant um i think it helped i, I think it's helped me uh, navigate a lot of the DeFi ecosystem which has 
boosts tremendous innovation with really interesting research and really interesting products. You know, if you, if you look at the type of stuff that Dan Robinson or, or, or Dave Wyve are, are putting out, for example, this is really interesting stuff and there's figure out, but also a whole lot of nonsense. And I think it gives me the ability to like figure out, you know, which 1% or 5% of this space is really genuinely interesting innovation and in which 95%, 99% is complete nonsense. So I think that's an, um, that's an advantage. The other thing is that as a, you know, like in terms of financial crisis and macro, it's never really been my, uh, my strong suits. I'm really uh, more of a micro uh, a guy and a, uh, um, like understanding uh, the, 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 the financial products and, and, and themselves and how they work. I don't know if there's going to be a crisis or not. I, I do think that there's been a very, very loose monetary policy in, in, uh, in the recent years, in, in a small part due to, uh, due to COVID. Um, you know, initially during the financial crisis, I saw that very loose monetary policy would lead to a lot of inflation. It didn't. So, you know, I got this one wrong. Um, I don't know that um, the stake will be wrong forever, though. Okay, so no new prediction here that we're taking away from whether or not you think a 2008-like crisis could happen here. You, you can talk to Rubini if you want I, hot takes. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I don't see a 2008 crisis, I think. Actually, you know, the thing is that they printed a lot in the 2008 crisis, and you, you still didn't have much inflation because it was a flight to, uh, there was a big flight to quality. People just wanted to deliver, deliver and just hold like riskless assets. So people just wanted to hold a bunch of dollars or Swiss francs or treasury bonds. So despite all the injection of money, it didn't really have that much of an effect. Uh, I think it might be different. We're seeing more inflationary pressures now than when we used to at the time. Um, and also a lot more economic activity. I also think that COVID was very transient as a crisis. So we, you know, I, 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 at the risk of making the same mistake that I make at the same time, this time I think we'll see some inflation. Right, but, right. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been historically wrong about this. Uh, and Kathleen, do you know what are the three countries that actually have the highest cryptocurrency trading volume? No idea. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Mostly unaware, I'd say. <laughs> it's actually the United States, Russia, and Nigeria. Um, and so we actually well, have, you know, in this country, <laughs> people are so fond of crypto that it also became one of the centers of NFTs. Ambreen Mdida and Gregory Rudier went to Lagos to meet the actors of this booming industry. They spent time with one of the biggest collectors of the country, Michael Ugu, a businessman and Grant, who wants Nigerian artists to thrive worldwide. So now we're gonna watch uh, the story in Nigeria. If there's one city that never stops, it's Lagos. It's Africa's largest mega city with 20 million citizens. It's quickly seized an opportunity. Nigeria has become the third largest user of cryptocurrencies in the world after Russia and the United States. Recently, the country has been going through an artistic revolution. It's now one of the cradles of NFTs. Something that's put a smile on Osinachi's face. He's one of the world's best known crypto artists. I'm Osinachi. I'm 30 years old. I'm also Africa's foremost crypto artist. Osinachi is one of the pioneers of NFTs. He started creating his digital works in 2017. There is this piece called A Beautiful Storm. Another one that was quite popular that is, is this one titled um, Choose the Man You Will Become. It's made in the form of a barbershop poster. It goes beyond the idea of a barber poster. It now represents choices that we make as human beings in life. Any other artists can decide to use whatever software that works for them. For some, it's Photoshop. I work with Microsoft Word. That is what I make my art with. And there's a lot of limitations with Microsoft Word because it's not meant to be used for art. Everything here, I can either group or move around and I put everything together, compose everything as I want, and I get to export as PNG or JPEG. I was still in secondary school when my dad um, introduced me to the internet. In those days, you had to go to a cyber cafe because you can't afford a computer at home. He took me to the cyber cafe, opened my first email, and just showed me a few things, and then I kept doing it, I kept going. And I think it was the love for the computer that made me stick to the love for creating art. 
His pieces are sold for thousands of dollars to collectors all around the world. In Lagos, one person saw Osinachi's talent straight away and bought several of his creations. My name is Michael Lugu and I am an investor and entrepreneur. He's also passionate about NFTs. His love of digital works is displayed on all the walls of his building. Yep, he has his own building. Even in his studio, with the artists he produces, he can't stop talking about NFTs. So that's Anne Green, the production company. They're doing something on, um, on NFTs. You know, I do, oh, I'm into yeah, yeah, blockchain. Yeah, I, you, I, need to come for tu I need to come for a tutorial. <laughs> I swear. I mean, I do, do. Real, I do crypto, but that's okay. kind of where I stop. Okay, okay. But I see you okay. going, Same you're family. going heavy Same on Same family. The... I am. I won't lie. I won't lie. I just see you be talking. You, you make me feel so ignorant. Ah, no, 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 no. We're so like, early. It, We're I told so you guys early. to get in on this. I'm like, I don't know what it is. <laughs> there are a couple of guys who are doing some things. I don't know if you heard of Osinachi. Mm -hmm. He's like probably the biggest crypto artist. I mean, his pieces mm -hmm. now, like biggest crypto artist out of Africa, his pieces now go for like $50,000, $90,000. Those amounts don't frighten the businessmen. I sleep, eat, and breathe NFTs. I have a pretty interesting collection. In less than a year, he's become the owner of more than 400 NFTs. This is a piece from Osinachi. Ferocious was one of the first artists that I bought. Her works can cost anything from, you know, half a million and, and up. I've been fortunate to have got some things, you know, at great prices. These cost like 0.2 ETH. When they sold, that's $614. So right now, it may be valued about 50, 60 ETH. Between $153 and $184,000. This is a Curio card. The cheapest Curio card I believe available is about 4.6 ETH, which is about $16,000. I bought it for a lot less than this, but uh, right now, I just wish I bought more, like everybody else. And do you have an idea of your collection's worth? I oh, know, I, 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 I wouldn't be able to, um, to, to say. <laughs> I, I, I have an idea, but um, to me, it's priceless. <laughs> this is fine art. I've been to the Louvre, I've seen um, the Mona Lisa, and I'm like, it's just, it's a lady who looks a bit angry. <laughs> the time when I first buying NFTs, I was like, okay, fine. If I'm early to this space, and we can still have the Van Goghs and the, the Monets and the Cezannes come out in this day and age, on this ecosystem, let me try and find those guys. What if one day these digital Van Goghs were featured in Nigerian museums? What if NFTs were to be found next to paintings and sculptures? Uh, I think I like this piece. The idea is slowly taking off. My name's Oyinda Mola Fakir. I'm an experiential art curator and a learning and participation producer. Contemporary art is always going to be innovating. I mean, let's look at Banksy. When Banksy was spray painting walls and he became like this huge artist, people were like, what the heck? You know, when Duchamp was putting toilets in galleries, people were like, what's going on here? Why I like crypto is because um, the starting point is, you know, almost the same for everyone. There are not that many commercial galleries representing artists. So it gives them an opportunity to represent themselves and to showcase and to make money. Osinachi is an example of this type of success story. Today, he can even afford to pay to avoid crossing a puddle. Just across this water, how much you go collect? Well, I'll give you 300. He comes from a modest family and never thought he would one day live in one of Lagos's most expensive neighborhoods. This is Lekki Phase 2, which is mostly developing. You have new houses that are coming up, that are being built. It's seen as the, um, what, what is this word? Is it upscale region of, of Lagos State? So they believe it's for the wealthy, which is true. To buy a house here, you have to have like good money in your account. He says he owes his fortune to one thing. Yeah, thanks to crypto art, I can do it, right? <laughs> so yeah, that's it. Let me take this call. Nah, how far? I don't want um, anyone to take it away that it's a get-rich-quick scheme. If your artwork isn't strong, if there's not, not much thought in your work, you're still going to face the same challenges. NFTs are all the rage across Nigeria. And that's something that they talk about, you know, in NFT space a lot, like, would you rather buy a Ferrari or would you rather buy a crypto punk? I'd buy a crypto punk. Michael Ugu is a trailblazer in Lagos. 
Today, he's been invited to Nigeria's very first conference entirely devoted to crypto art. The event's all the more remarkable because the Nigerian Central Bank has banned cryptocurrency transactions. Rather than putting Nigerian collectors off, more and more people want a share of the booming NFT market. August saw $3 billion of NFT sales worldwide, a tenfold increase in just a month. How's it going? Cool. Nice My name is Shuta. We want to make sure that Nigerians and Africans generally don't miss out on the opportunities that blockchain technology offers. And we are focusing on NFT. And as you know, Africa is very rich in culture and creativity. So all of these can be a unique opportunity for us to rewrite our story as Africans. Okay? So if we can unlock the wealth that we have in residual form through NFTs, then we don't need to be begging for um, aid from um, Western nations. You know? It's important we tell our stories. Uh, I don't think it's heard enough, and I don't think um, people understand the average African and how the average African lives, and I think that there's, there's a big opportunity there. And I want to be part of that. So I'll do my part. I'll try to do my part as long as God gives me the energy and the strength. And actually, since we've come back from Nigeria, uh, Ochinati has actually been the first African artist to have one of his NFTs sold at Christie's. So, you know, this is a really huge space, as you guys know, and continuing to grow. You know, Kathleen, I'm curious, um, you know, the Tezos blockchain obviously supports NFTs, but, you know, what is something about this that you think is an enabler for artists or people in a way that, you know, it might not have been before from previous systems? Oh, it doesn't just support NFTs. It's also the um, place where one of the largest NFT marketplaces in the world uh, takes place. And so, you know, unsurprisingly, the artist that you just featured um, has also minted on Tezos. Um, and he probably does so because they have low fees. Um, it has, uh, you know, also a more ecologically friendly platform uh, than Ethereum, which is the prevailing NFT, uh, I guess, um, blockchain. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, a place where people rush to for quality. So, um, you know, Tezos has been thriving with the NFT boom. And you also were able to have um, the infamous Doja Cat on your... She's not infamous, she's famous because she's awesome. <laughs> like, uh, Doja Cat's great. Yeah, she <laughs> is. Independent of anything on Tezos, she, Say So is a great song. So, yeah, I mean, I uh, I totally agree. Uh, what, what has having someone with her fame and sort of like global stature being involved with Tezos, what has that meant to you both? Um, I mean, it's good validation, but like it's also good validation that Mario Klingemann's on there and a lot of other famous artists who are, are you know, um, extraordinarily talented in their own stead. Um, more importantly, it allows people who couldn't afford to basically mint on Ethereum a uh, venue and a forum to basically, uh, you know, express themselves. And I think that's beautiful in its own right, Doja Cat or no Doja Cat. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're trying to be a democratic, uh, you know, forum for people to, to mint um, and basically trade, uh, you know, NFTs without the burden of Ethereum's gas fees um, and impact on the environment. And I think we're doing that quite well. You've mentioned a few things, but if you had to very clearly state why Tezos as a project is differentiated from other NFT marketplaces or just as a project on the blockchain, what would, what would you want people to absolutely know? I think the most important one is the governance and the fact that it's uh, community operated. Yeah, uh, makes good on its promises. Makes good, yeah. well, the, yeah, but that's, that's, I think that's a characteristic of the project more so than the, than the, than the technology itself. Yeah, fair enough. That it, you know, it, it, it's in the hand of its community and it constantly upgrades. I think that's the number one. And you know, two, a, 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 a solid and innovative technological stack. Uh, in, you know, it's a project which has soul and I think that's really hard to, uh, to, uh, to replicate. Thank you very much for both of you coming to, to speak with us today. This is a place for uh, crypto curious and crypto newbies, so it's important when they hit Google search to understand where things have come from and why. So thanks for Thank joining you. us. Have a good one. Okay, well, thanks a lot to Arthur and Kathleen for joining us today. Now, we just went to Nigeria discussing the NFT scene. And so I suggest we keep going and opening more doors and going further down the rabbit hole. This is the deep dive, our dive into the depths of NFTs, where we see what's happening with Axie Infinity. And this is by Kareem Morbaj. 
Welcome to The Deep Dive, your weekly cultural journey into the new world of tokenized art. Artists, people, businessmen, politics, it's the place to be. Virtual reality. Non-fungible token. I'm going to Disney World! Metaverse. NFT. <laughs> Who, how, when, why? We'll tell you everything in The Deep Dive. And before we take a look at the most recent gossip about the crazy world of crypto art these last few days, we have good news for you. Oh my God, what is that? You've always dreamed of being a pro gamer, but you don't have any particular skills in Call of Duty, Fortnite, or League of Legends? Want to collect NFTs but don't have $69 million to invest in a piece of digital art? Want to raise animals but your apartment is too small? Then play Axie Infinity. With Axie Infinity, earn money, lots of money, by playing video games while collecting NFT. It's real, it works. <laughs> So, Axie Infinity is a video game launched in 2018 by the Vietnamese company Sky Mavis and founded by three men, Trunk Nguyen, Jeffrey Zerlin, and Alexander Larson. The goal of the game is simple, to raise, collect, and battle these adorable little creatures with various attacks and skills in a turn-based team. Pikachu! Yeah, it does sound a bit like Pokemon, which is also an assumed inspiration in the Axie Infinity white paper, except that it evolves on Ethereum. And each little monster named Axie that the player owns is an NFT. We're using this blockchain technology. The number of Axies being limited, the notion of scarcity plays an essential role in the universe of the game. Each monster or collectible object in the game has a real value on the exchange platforms. Essentially, Axie Infinity is a crypto game, and playing it requires a basic investment. It's quite expensive to get started playing Axie right now. The player must buy at least three of these NFTs to be able to enter the arena. And with a floor price of $300 per Axie, playing will require you to spend at least $900. And in fact, in order to do this, it's very simple. Download MetaMask, create a MetaMask account, then download an exchange client, create an account on the client, buy Ethers, synchronize your MetaMask account with the client, choose the ERC20 network, then go to the Axie Infinity Marketplace, choose three Axies, carefully study their skills, don't rush it, buy the Axies, then download Axie Infinity, install Axie Infinity, synchronize Axie Infinity with the Marketplace, create a new team, place your Axies in it. There you go, you're ready for some cute fighting. Okay, well, it's a bit complicated, but it can be worth it because in addition to the fun of the game, Axie Infinity follows the economic model of play-to-earn video games and rewards regular players who contribute to the ecosystem of the game. You could actually own a part of the game and make money. By winning battles against other players or against artificial intelligence, and by completing relatively simple quests, players receive AXS, or SLP, which are tokens directly convertible into cryptocurrencies. So playing becomes profitable. Axie, I think, is uh, an answer to this question of, okay, what does an NFT with true utility look like? You know, how can we actually create a system where people can turn their time and effort into real value? Inevitably, the question arises. How is that possible? Well, to make it simple, extremely simple, the money and value generated by Axie Infinity players are shared between the players, where traditionally in video games, the money generated goes to the developers. You could, you could spend real money to get an in-game in you know, skin in Fortnite to help you look cool or, or various things but you, you no longer owned it. It was just property of the game. By spending about two hours a day, an average player, or even a not very good one, can earn an average of $500 a month. Whoa, that's cool. And of course, playing video games and making money without being an eSport genius, a little bit like not being a pro basketball player, but still getting paid to play in your backyard, it draws people in. The primary source of demand for Axies is people who want to earn. In emerging Southeast Asian countries like the Philippines, playing Axie Infinity pays almost twice the average wage. Gaming has become a profession in its own right. Entire villages have taken over, and real sponsorship programs called scholarships have sprung up to allow players who don't have the initial capital to start grinding. This is actually a problem that our community solved for us. And Axie Infinity's numbers are insane. The Axie community is on its way to becoming the largest community on Discord with over 800,000 members. In a single year, the game has grown from 200,000 monthly players to 20 million. And Axie Infinity has become the largest NFT collection in the world with a total trading volume of... 2.2 billion dollars! And when you're head of growth at Axie Infinity, like good old Jeffrey Zerlin, clearly the job is done. By redefining the rules of gaming, opening the world of cryptocurrencies to an audience that was not predestined for it, and offering opportunities in the real world, Axie Infinity is on its way to becoming precisely what it aspires to be, a metaverse. And to conclude this deep dive, here's a quick tour of the short stories that have agitated the crypto cultural news these last days. These are the quick dives. Who's gonna break the news? 
And we start with the revelation of the week. While many people were wondering about the identity of the famous and powerful NFT investor Cosimo Medici, the rapper and businessman Snoop Dogg revealed through a very short tweet to be behind the famous nickname. Cosimo had made himself known by sharing on Twitter his fine analysis of the digital art market and by buying NFTs of magnitude like CryptoPunks, MeBits, or ArtBlocks. I'm living a fast life. Jet after jet and trying to keep my cash right. Let's take a small detour now by the short video site TikTok. In a press release, the social network announced it would launch its own NFT in the near future by partnering with artists such as Rudy Willingham or Lil Nas X, both very present on the platform. Be fashion, popping up in movies, ain't no Nazi bitches Ashton. Social networks again, and the big announcement from Twitter. After having announced that tips in Bitcoin would soon be possible on the Blue Bird platform, Twitter announced through a video from engineer Mata Aflac that the integration of NFT was in the experimental phase. So basically you would be able to edit your profile, click on your avatar and select NFT. From this, you would be able to connect to your wallet. If Meta Affleck specifies that this is only an experiment, it shows Twitter's will to rely on NFT in order to certify one's identity. And then you will have your NFT as your avatar with the Ethereum uh, check mark. Well, the deep dive is over for today. See you next week for a new dive into the tokenized world. And that was the deep dive. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. We went to Lagos together, learned why everyone's obsessed with Axie Infinity, and we were able to talk to the couple where we don't know if they're gonna make it or break it on the blockchain with Tezos. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and join next week because you don't know what's gonna happen down the rabbit hole.